A prayer of thanksgiving for you said your cousin. Is that right? Okay. That's awesome. Does anyone have anything else? 
I invite you to uh, join me in the for you. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you so much this morning that we can come together as a family, that we can worship you, that we can spend this day uh, no concerns about our work or our other weekly. Watching the clock, we will not be done by noon. But we will keep it as short as possible. I want to share with you something that happened uh, a few weeks ago, actually, and it kind of ties into what we did today. It was a Bible study that I was uh, doing with a, uh, a couple of people uh, that were over in the Junction City area. Um, they, they were asking me about some things, and we've been studying together. And they posed a question to me, and I shared this with the, the students down at the elementary school for worship a few weeks ago. They said, why do you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit when uh, it looks like in the New Testament that the disciples only baptize in the name of Jesus? Interesting question. Hadn't had it before. Had taken some time, talked with some other colleagues. You know, it's just one that we hadn't looked at before. I finally had an opportunity to get back together with them. It was about three weeks ago now. And and we were going to talk about it some more and, and share, and I was going to share some of the things I had found. And what I didn't realize was is they were they were setting me up for an ambush that night. They had brought along with them a, a what would be the equivalent of their head elder from their church who um, believed in the, doc, the, the Unitarian type of doctrine that there is only one God. And they did not believe that there were separate entities of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, I didn't know this. When we got into the Bible study, I thought we were talking about baptism. They wanted to talk about the Trinity doctrine. But they weren't coming straight on with it. They were asking roundabout questions. And finally, when I about a half hour into it, when I realized that this was not the issue about baptism and the, the method of baptism, but it had a lot more impact on what we understand as sometimes is called the Trinity. Now, you won't find the name Trinity anywhere in the Bible. That term does not exist. But you will find a reference to it, and the plurality of God is mentioned there, and um, that's what I want to talk to you today about. But once I realized they had some, a burden to share, I began to just listen 
shared, they spent about two hours talking to me, convinced, trying to convince me of what they believe. They are passionate about this belief in the oneness of God. It's a, it's a Pentecostal um, teaching that has been around for some time, but it has been tweaked now. And I want to tell you, the arguments that they use is, is very strong, and I would consider it, for us, it, it could cause a church family to misunderstand if we didn't talk about it from the Bible and what we understand. Um, they're passionate about it, and they believe about as strongly in this as we probably as Seventh-day Adventists do in the Sabbath and some of our teachings. And, and, and so they shared with me for a while where they were coming from, and I'll kind of relate some of those as we go. But I want to come back, and I want to talk to you why this is important for us to talk about today. And that is, is because of our 28 fundamental beliefs that we have, four of them is directly tied into the understanding about the Godhead made up of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The first of our 28 fundamental beliefs says that we believe in the Bible as it's inspired by God. The second one says this, and it's titled the Trinity. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and ever-present. He is infinite and beyond human comprehension, yet known through his self-revelation. He is forever worthy of worship, adoration, ser and service by the whole creation. Our third, fourth, and fifth fundamental beliefs that we have are called the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so what you find is four of our 28 fundamental beliefs deal specifically with this. And yet I know people sometimes struggle and wrestle with this. And if you were to listen to this, um, th these people teach, you could almost, because I could almost go along and see it from their perspective. And so we're going to look at some of their arguments, and then we're going to look and see what the Bible has to say about it. And we're going to go kind of back and forth a little bit. Please, I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want to be up here. I'm not meant to church bash. I'm not here to knock them. They are Bible students who are doing their best to understand. I'm not attacking them. Please, I hope you understand that. I just simply want to argue from God's word and give you an opposing view in case you ever meet with this or you know somebody, you would be able to respond and say, well, this is what I believe and here's why. This is what I want to do for you today. So I'm not attacking them. I just want to assure you where we're coming from. Historically, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, and by the way, this is starting to come back now within the Seventh-day Adventist church. There are people who are going back to this oneness teaching. And the reason for it is, is they're reading some of our early founding fathers' um, writings, people like James White, Uriah Smith, and others, who were Unitarians at the time when we first came together out of the Millerite movement. We came from many, many doctrines and divisions coming together to form this church. And there were individuals who did believe in the Unitarian teaching of the one God. And you will find it in some of our early writings. People will now say, well, look, James White said it here in Signs of the Time, or excuse me, in um, the one he was writing. Suddenly it slipped. The review is what it is today. But um, And you will see in, in Daniel and Revelation, Uriah Smith has Unitarian views. And, and so some people will say, well, let's get back to the way they believed. Let me tell you right now. Ellen White believed in the Godhead. And if you want to look at her writings about that, type in the search, the Godhead, and that is, uh, and you will find the Trinity mentioned there over and over by Ellen White. She believed in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we're going to share today. But you can't use Ellen White as an argument with your neighbors and friends when it comes to talking about this. So we need to go to God's Word and explain it from there. But I wanted to talk to the family explain, yes, you will see it in some of our writings, but you will not find it in Ellen White. She was Trinitarian in her view, not Unitarian. Here's some of the texts that they use. Deuteronomy 6.4. Deuteronomy 6.4. Probably the most powerful text that they will use in sharing their doctrine. It says, and you've heard it before, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You bet you. And then Ephesians 4, 
verses 4 through 6, part of what Wesley read earlier today. I, I didn't hear all the verses he read because I was in the back, but I know he was going that direction. Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6 says there is one body and one spirit just as you were called in one hope of your calling one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all and their argument is is that that what has happened is and this is what they will tell you is that they said what happened was is when the when the church was in the time of compromise and they were trying to 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 unite with paganism and make it more comfortable that what they did is they said these pagans were used to worshiping multiple gods and so the church compromised and came up with the teaching of the trinity so that they could make paganism more comfortable in christianity that's the argument that i make concerning sabbath and sunday right as some of the adventists we they use that argument interestingly enough almost every argument that we use for keeping the Sabbath, they use for the belief in the oneness of God. And it's a very interesting parallel. They said, the Jews, talk to any Jew today, and they only believe in one God, not three. And I'd say, well, talk to any Jew today, they only worship on Sabbath, not Sunday. And, and we can go around like that. They, they, they took me to Revelation, they said, look, there's the harlot and her daughters, and, and, they're going to, and the daughters are the churches who are following the way of the harlot. And they said, see, this has been brought to even our day. And I said, well, yeah, that's right. But I use that on the, for the Sunday versus Sabbath argument. And so I want to tell you, this is a very powerful thing that is being used. And this is what's happening here. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 6, 4, though. That's the, that's the strongest one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But does the Bible, the Bible anywhere, teach otherwise? How do we answer the question posed by Deuteronomy and the text that we find here? How do we respond to it? Well, what we found is is that I believe that God has revealed himself in his word, and he's revealed enough for us to understand. While we might not understand fully everything about God, he's given us enough that we can have faith in him. He's given us enough, enough to understand where he's coming from. And I think he made it very clear in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, you know, if they want to use Deuteronomy, which is a book of Moses, I'm going to use Genesis, which is also a book of Moses, and let's talk together. Right here in creation, we discover the plurality of God in the language that's mentioned at creation. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. At the end of creation, he has done all the other work. The only thing left is mankind to make. And God says here in in this text, and in the original language, it's just as plural as it is here in English. And it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle of all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. When you hear the language, you hear it say in plural terms, let us make man in our image. How many does it take to make us? One or more than one? There's got to be more than one to have an us, right? Otherwise it gets kind of creepy. And it says, you know, you hear that joke, you know, me, myself, and I, we're the majority, we're the creed. But uh, this is not what it's talking about. Let us Make man in our image. Look at Genesis 3, verse 22. Genesis 3, verse 22. After the sin happens with Adam and Eve, then the Lord God said, now when it says that, the Lord God, that sounds singular. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat live forever. They had to take some action. You see, Adam and Eve was removed from the garden. But you see there again, like one of us, there's more than one there in that text. Genesis 11, verse 7 is another one. 11, verse 7, here, it's after the flood. The descendants of Noah have gone down to the plain. They begin building this great tower, 
and, and to, it's in rebellion to God. If he ever sends a flood, we'll, we'll, we can counteract it. We can climb up the tower. And so it says in 11 verse 7, God says, Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Old Testament teaching again. Isaiah 6 verse 8. See, one of their arguments was is that you don't find any hint of the Trinity teaching until you get to the New Testament. And I'd like to say, no, it's evident in the Old Testament. Isaiah 6, verse 8 is another place. Here is the commission of Isaiah to be a spokesperson for God. You might remember he's in vision here, and he, he sees God, and he's saying, woe is me. And, 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 um, and then it goes on touched with the coal of fire and finally in verse 8 it says also I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send now I is that singular or plural singular whom shall I send and who will go for us plural you see God is one in function God is one and so Deuteronomy is absolutely right when it says the Lord, the Lord is one. There is no other God out there. There is only the creator God. There is one God. And yet, within these texts, we find that it is also plural. That it makes up, that it takes individuals to make up who, what God is and how God works. And that's confusing had he not done something in Genesis to clarify it. Now, you remember Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the Hebrew word that is used there in that word one is also found in Genesis 2, verse 24. I don't know Hebrew, but I have a strong concordance. And you can look up the word one there in Deuteronomy and find that it's the same Hebrew word as the word one in Genesis. This is how you can get around if you not have the original languages, I don't, but you can find out. And in Genesis 2, verse 24, the same word for one is used here, and I think God has made it very clear how this whole multiple personalities can be one, and here's what it says, Genesis 2, verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Two individuals, husband and wife, joined together, they become one flesh, according to God. This is what marriage is about. Marriage describes to us how it works with God. Now, we live in a sinful world, and marriage has many flaws today. This is why Satan attacks marriage so heavily, because it actually tells us about God and who he is when the marriage is working properly. And Satan doesn't like that because when a husband and wife are unified together, they represent how it works with God when the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are unified together and working as one. I found out that it's important to be unified, by the way, when you have children. I'll be downstairs. Sherry will be upstairs. David wants some chocolate milk. Daddy, can I have some chocolate milk? What does Mama say? Oh, she says it's okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> check with Mama. I go up and I check with Mama. Oh, he's already had chocolate milk today. He doesn't need any more. Uh, yeah, she probably said it was okay earlier. But he wants to divide and conquer. Kids are good at that. you got to stay unified. And this is how it works with God. Now, while... <laughs> Those are the texts in the Old Testament, and I will admit, in the Old Testament, you do see a weak argument for the Trinity or for the Godhead. It's there. It's evident, especially in Genesis. It's evident that there is more than one. But it's not until we get to the New Testament that we find the strongest evidence of it, and that is through Jesus and how he revealed who God was to us. Matthew 28, 19. Is, is the text that I, I say is a defining text. Though we don't build our doctrines on just one text, Matthew 28, 19 has got to be a very powerful one to work with. Jesus said this, so we 
take it up with him. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Those are strong words. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth. This is the great commission. Jesus is saying, I am the one who is giving the commands. And here is the command. And he says, do it in the name. I always find it interesting. Why does he say name, singular, and then give us three names? Baptized in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, plural. Well, that is really who God is. God is three in one. It is both. It is in the name of God, who is made up of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's exactly what we saw in Isaiah. Who, who will I send and who will go for us? One, plural, three. It works. This is how God reveals himself to us. Their argument, though, to me was, well, wait a minute. After the disciples get this, and then when they baptize in Acts, every time they baptize, they always do it just in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't see them using the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'd like to argue that they're not talking about how they do the baptism then, but more times than not, every time they talk about the baptism, they're talking about the fact that these people just found out that Jesus was the Messiah. That they had been baptized before by John the Baptist and others, but now they're being baptized knowing that Jesus is the Messiah. So when they baptize, it's because they're becoming Christian. And they're now followers of Jesus Christ. But take a look at 2 Corinthians 13, 14, because you find evidence of the Trinity there. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. This is the last verse of this letter written to the Corinthians. This is how Paul ends his writings to the Corinthians. Listen for the Trinity. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The Trinity is there. Paul believed it. Jesus taught it. You find it in the Old Testament. Find it at Jesus' baptism. Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17. You might remember, and I'm going to start speeding things up now. I, uh, we're, we've taken enough time, but I'm going to speed some things up. You remember the baptism. Jesus comes up out of the water. Here's the son. He's just been baptized. He's, he's uh, wet, like Linda was wet just a few minutes ago. He's standing there, and at the same time, John says that he sees the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove. Don't get confused. It wasn't a bird that landed on him. It was descending down softly and gently, raining down upon him. He saw the Holy Spirit, and then he also heard the voice of God say, Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, if Jesus is everything, which is their argument, then what Jesus did there was stage an elaborate show. It, and their argument, by the way, they've changed. The, the old Pentecostal teaching used to be that God the Father was the God, the Jehovah God. You'll hear another denomination out there that believes in the Jehovah is the one true God. This isn't just Pentecostal. It's in other places. And, and that Jesus had been a created being that, that came about just made by God. They use the word begotten to say made. Who, who was made to die for us. God couldn't do it for himself, so he created somebody else to do it in our behalf. They, I mean, it's so God, the Word became flesh and dwelt with man, if you're looking at that chapter. 
So it says the Word was with God and the Word was God. That tells us that Jesus was there with the Father from all of eternity. Jesus is divine and human. The old way used to kind of make Jesus just human and not divine. Their way would say that there is no one else. I would say that there is both based on the Bible. John chapter 14 is another one. <coughs> John chapter 5, if you want to do it logically. John chapter 5, one of my favorite texts that talks about the judgment. John chapter 5, verse 24. I know I've left my computer guy. I'm sorry. I'm off my notes now. <laughs> John chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. So who hears my word and believes in him who sent me. There's at least two there that Jesus is talking about. He says, and has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. How does Jesus know that for a fact? When you get down farther, uh, farther the next couple texts, verse 26, John 5, says, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him, that means the Father gave to the Son, authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of it's saying that the Father has given the right of judgment of humankind and our rebellion to Jesus, and Jesus says, I'm willing to represent them as their lawyer. It's one of the greatest messages we have. Talk about the gospel being good news. The judgment's a sure thing when you have Jesus. Because you've hired the judge to be your lawyer, and he says, I've never lost a case. Well, of course not. It's, it's rigged in our favor. But if Jesus is the Father, then he's basically saying, I gave myself the authority to do this. What's up with that? It doesn't make sense. Logically, that text would not make sense, except that there be a Father and a Son, and it transfers from one to the other. There's more. But I want to end with this one. This is an argument made by a biblical scholar named and he says, of all the arguments about the Godhead, the one that he finds to be the strongest, that, you, that he says, this, you have to answer this question, is found in 1 John 4, 8. And it's also repeated again in verse 16. 1 John 4, 8, and then also again in verse 16, when it clearly defines who God is. And it's not just saying what a characteristic of God is like, it's saying, this is the essence of God. Here's 1 John 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is what? It doesn't say God has love. It says God is love. And now hang on, because this is a really deep thought. It took me a while to wrap my mind around it, and let me see if I can explain this. Could one who has existed from all eternity past who made us in his loving image, could this God truly be called love if he existed only as a solitary being? Think about it. Before anything else was created, God existed. For a moment, that will, that will tax your mind. Don't spend too much time with that. We understand creation and birth. And, but God existed before anything else created, and, and, and it says that God is love, it says, is not love, especially divine love, possible if only if the one who made our universe was a plural being who was exercising love within his divine plurality from all eternity past? This is what he's asking. Basically, he's saying it had to be a multiple persons working together in the Godhead for God to be de uh, designated here as God is love. Three of them showing the love and then creating the universe. He goes, he goes on to say then, or argue, that you couldn't have that love with just one, loving himself. But it was the love between the three of them that defines who God is and also defines who, why he created and went on to create us and do what he has done for us.